led a Bible study on this parable. It's the parable of the prodigal son, in case it's, it's new to some of you. Um, I was in seminary in Chicago, working at a, at a church sort of uh, on the west side there. And the priest said to me, and he said to me like 10 minutes before the service was about to start, listen, after the service, why don't you leave the Bible study? I'm like, thanks for the heads up, you know? <laughs> but I think he figured, look, this is a familiar and a rich parable, it'll be easy for me to leave. And I don't know, I, I suppose there could be a first parable. Um, so there were like maybe 12 people in this in this room, in this Bible study, and there, there was uh, one mom who brought her son, 10 years of age, I think, sitting there. And we begin to go through the parable, we, we sort of look at the twists and turns, we talk about the son, and then, comes to his father and asks for his inheritance and then leaves his father and then squanders all the money and, and, and then he comes back to her grumbling to the father. And we talk about the father's response, about how the father, when the son returns, rushes out and embraces him and, and, and dresses him in new robes, gives him a ring, throws him a big party. We talk about all of that. And I say to the group, I say, so, so what do you make of the father's actions? Now, throughout this whole time, the, the 10-year-old boy, he'd been sitting there behaving himself pretty well. He was, he was quiet, completely quiet. He was reading a book. This is back before, you know, smartphones and, and little games like that. And he was doing well. I didn't really think he was paying attention. But I said to the group, so what are you making the father? And the 10-year-old, without missing a beat, piped up. He said, well, he's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> He has no money, he has no resources, nothing saved in the bank. 
and he's got a stoop as low as looking for a job, and, and to add insult to injury, he ends up working for a pig farm. Imagine the disgrace for a Jewish man to be working for a pig farm. Not only is he, is he sort of throwing food into the pig and, and, and cleaning up after the pig, but he's so hungry, he looks at the slot that he's feeding the pig and thinking, there's a better diet. This guy has fallen so far away from his family, has wandered so far away from his home, he has reached unimaginable depths of disgrace. So he comes to his senses. He comes to himself, I think it's the phrase. And he thinks, he comes up with a plan. He's like, all right, you know, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to my, my dad. And he works up this, this sort of spiel, this speech, this, this, this kind of plea. He's like, so I, I'm going to tell my dad, look, I sinned against you before God and the tail, and I don't deserve to be your son, um, but just take me back to the higher man. Just, just do that. Because the dad's higher hands are living better than he is. So he turns around and he begins to walk home. And, and Jesus describes the father's reaction, which is in some ways even more remarkable than his first response to the son when he gave this inheritance. Because the father must be looking out the window. We hear that the son doesn't even get near the house. The father goes running up the field, running up the field, embraces his son in this loving hug, calls to the slaves and says, bring me the robe, gets the jewelry, kills the fatted calf and throws him this big welcome home party. Can you imagine how the neighbors must have been snared, right? <laughs> They knew the whole story. They look, even though there was no Instagram or Facebook, they knew what the son had been up to. Right? How embarrassing this must have been. What kind of self-respecting Palestinian man would make a fool of himself in this sort of way? Would go running through the fields, would, would throw himself on his son, tears pouring down his cheeks, and then would lavish these kind of gifts on him. Now, don't get me wrong, the neighbors who were making fun of him, they still came to the party, because, you know, the bad cat was killed. But can you imagine? So I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I'm guessing that that 10-year-old boy from my Bible study isn't the only one right now in the room who thinks that the dad was maybe a little bit of an idiot. You don't have to raise your hand. It is outrageous. It is crazy. It is foolish. It is wild behavior. But here's the thing. If we're going to name the dad as an idiot, then we need to understand something about this parable. Because this parable is not about a farmer. This parable is about God. And if we're going to name the dad as an idiot, then, then we're going we're gonna to have to say, well, God's kind of an idiot too. Because make no mistake about this. What Jesus is trying to say to these, to these Pharisees who are, who are corrupting and judging him for spending time with the tax collectors and the so-called sinners is that there is no limit to God's love. There is no way to imagine how God so wants to be in relationship with each and every person, including the tax collectors, including the sinners. The depth of God's desire to be in relationship with us knows no bounds. The power of God's love to reach out to us has no limit, does not change. God loves us that much. God is ready to be that kind of fool to be in relationship with us. To be, to be every bit the fool that that father was when his son came home. God's just waiting. God's just watching. And, and, 
And make no mistake also about this. We don't have to grovel. We don't have to prepare a spiel. We don't have to earn our way into God's good graces again. God is waiting. God is watching. And just as the son barely got out an apology to his father, we barely need to utter a word to God because God loves us so much, God's going to interrupt us. God's going to say, stop your grumbling. Just come here and hug me. Because the power of God's love is that great. Because the desire God has for us is that strong. We need not problem. We need not beg. All we got to do is turn around. All we got to do is turn around. Because God's looking out the window waiting for us. This is a great story to have for Lent. When there's all this language about repent, repent, repent. Do you know what in the, in the Greek New Testament, do you know what the word repent means? It means to turn around. I think that this word repent, it, it so turns people off. I get why, because I think it gets thrown about the way that that, that just oftentimes makes us feel lousy about us. But all God is asking us to do by calling us to repent is to turn around and then God will do the rest. I love it that Jesus says, while, while the sun was still far away, God didn't, the Father didn't meet him halfway. The Father didn't stand in the doorway going, all right, let's see what he's got to say for himself. The father, like a fool, went running over the hill to embrace him. All we got to do is turn around. Um, I think it was a couple years ago we read uh, a book written by Henry Nowen on the father and son. It's one of my most favorite sort of writings about, um, about this parable. And now it said in this book, now I wonder whether I have sufficiently realized that during all this time, God has been trying to find me, to know me, and to love me. The question, now it writes, the question is not how am I to find God, but the question is really how am I to let myself be found by God? The question is not, how am I to know God, but how am I to let myself be known by God? And finally, the question is not, how am I to love God, but how am I to let myself be loved by God? Now it finishes, God is looking into the distance for me, trying to find me, and longing to bring you. That's the meaning of the power of the sun. That's the meaning of the Lenten journey. We have a God who is waiting and longing to bring us home. And if you turn around, there's hope waiting for us. It's that simple. Not always easy, but that's simple. So, was God an idiot? Oh, I might be a little strong. Certainly the fool. But you know what? I think the biggest fool in this story, it's not the father. The biggest fool in this story is the older son who refuses to come in and join him. 